You're watching WSTV Digital Media. I'd like to call the meeting to order welcome you to the May 10, 2018 meeting of the City County Planning Board. Would you please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Today's meeting is being broadcast live by TV 13. It will be rebroadcast at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning and again at 4 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Our first order of business today is consent agenda. <clears throat> These are items for which the petitioner is requesting withdrawal or continuance or items for which the staff has recommended approval and no one has signed up to speak in opposition. For public hearings today, each side will have a total of 12 minutes. There is no rebuttal period. Once the public hearing is closed and the board goes into work session, no one is permitted to speak unless a planning board member asks a question. For general use district zoning, the board must consider the full range of uses allowed in the zoning district. Therefore, the petitioner may not refer to specific use of the property. For special use district zoning, however, you must be very specific about the details of how the site will be developed and the uses proposed for the site. Items under Section B of their agenda require final action by either the City Council or County Commissioners. As such, votes taken today will be forwarded to those bodies for their consideration. If you're addressing the board today, we will need your name, address, and zip code for the record. And before we get into the approval of the minutes, I believe Ms. Dunnigan had a correction to the May, uh, April, uh, April 26th meeting. For, yeah, for the work session. Right. Um, item four, um, where it's talking about the um, area plan process, um, I just wanted to clarify um, that the recommendation I made for the Renolda Road Northern Beltway interchange area, I would like to just make sure that that's changed to um, the interchange area between US 52 and Renolda Road. To, uh, to all the interchanges in that corridor, yes. right? Okay. Is that the only only that change? Was it. Okay. With that correction, uh, are there any other corrections or additions to the minutes? Yes, sir. If not, I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. Motion, Mr. Grubbs. Second, Mr. Leak. Any discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. I'll now call on uh, Mr. King to present our consent agenda. <laughs> okay. First item is item B1, it's on the docket W3367. And this is a request to rezone about a half an acre from RS9 and highway business to highway business special use for the use of motor vehicle repair and maintenance and offices. And you can see the subject property there in yellow uh, on the east side of Nicholson Road, north of Kernersville Road in the Five Points area. So the large building to the left of that image is the King Plaza Shopping Center. You've got some various businesses on the north side, north and south side of Kernersville and Walltown Street there. To the north, you've got some scattered single-family homes zoned RS9 and then Hall Woodward Elementary. Uh, to the top of the image there, zoned IP. And this is the site plan that's been submitted with this request. So if you can see the zoning line, it is running diagonal through the middle of the property. Um, the left-hand side of this image is currently zoned highway business. Uh, the right-hand side is currently zoned RS9. What's being proposed is about a 1,700 square foot uh, motor vehicle repair and maintenance building with three garage bays, which you can see here. Uh, this would actually be on the south side of the site. The site will connect to the existing five points tire and auto in this location here. There will be one new driveway uh, connection onto Nicholson Road in this area. Uh, nine parking spaces will be installed to meet the parking requirements to the front and side of the building, street yard along Nicholson, and then a type three buffer yard will be required to be installed along adjacent to the RS9 property to the north. 
stormwater would be located in that northeastern corner. Uh, also in this area, staff recommended a wooden opaque fence, and the petitioner uh, did provide that, so we commend them on that to help uh, provide a better transition of that residential property to the north. In reviewing this, uh, the area plan does recommend commercial for this site. However, it does mention uh, NB and LB as being uh, appropriate districts. When we reviewed this, we believe that this HBS request was reasonable for a few reasons. Um, one, we worked with the developer. The original request had the garage bays facing north or that home that's closest there to the north. We did work with the developer to get the building oriented differently so those garage bays are faced away from that home and out towards Nicholson Road. Second, as I mentioned to you, there is a type three buffer with a six foot tall wooden opaque fence along that property line with uh, the adjacent residential property there. And third, although there are two single family homes across Nicholson, they are zoned highway business general use. So given those considerations, staff believes this is a reasonable request and we would recommend approval of uh, W3367. No one has signed up. Is anyone here opposed to this recommendation? Said no one. I'll declare the public hearing closed. Second. Motion, Mr. Grubb. Second, Mr. Leak. In discussion. I had a question <clears throat> uh, about the wooden opaque fence. Um, is it? Would it be possible for there to be wi razor wire on top of that fence? Mm -hmm. I've never. I haven't seen it on top of a wood fence. I don't know that we have a condition that specifically. Because I noticed you have a condition that mentions chain link fencing. Right. And so I was wondering if, if it was possible to put a razor wire. And I, th I just think that would be inappropriate. I'll, I'll defer to the petitioner if they would be, if the board wants to entertain a condition to prohibit that, it would be up to the petitioner. Well, sir, if you want to address, just come up here, please, and give us your name and address. We Is he coming? Or, or still discuss? Okay. We just need your name and address, please, sir. Uh, Edward Malone, 6102 O'Brien Court, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27410. Thanks, sir. Uh, now, there, there's never been any thought of putting any kind of wire or anything on top of the wooden fence. You know, that would kind of, uh, you know, they just no thought there. So no problem if we put a condition of no wire, then you're okay with that, right? Yeah, there's no consideration for that. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions, Ms. Nolan? No, okay. Thanks, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. We um, have a motion. You want to amend your motion? I'll be glad to amend it to add the condition that no razor wire be placed on top of the wooden opaque fence. Second. Second that. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, next item is B2. It's only docket W3368, and this is a request to rezone about three quarters of an acre from RS9 to general business special use over on Sedge Garden Road. Uh, the applicant has requested this be continued to your June meeting. They got that uh, request in by the automatic deadline, so this is continued to June, and no vote is needed on this item. Next item is C1. This is subdivision 2018-023. Uh, this is a 27-lot subdivision in RS9 zoning on about 16 acres. Uh, this two main roads in this area, if you can follow the mouse, Olivet Church is in this area, and then Yadkinville Road, that intersection is in this area. Heritage Oaks Lane, the first phase of that subdivision is located here, and what you're looking at today would essentially be the second phase of that subdivision. So again, to get you oriented, Heritage Oaks Lane is coming in from the left uh, side of this image. That public street would be continued to serve these, these 27 new lots. 
Um, again, this is not a PRD, so we're not looking at open space or buffer yards. It's a conventional subdivision. So all of the lots are at least 9,000 square feet in size and at least 65 feet in width. And I will add that most of these lots are substantially larger than 9,000 square feet in size. Um, it does meet UDA requirements, and staff would recommend approval of this subdivision request. Move approval. A motion, Mr. Grubbs. A second. A second, Mr. Leake. Any discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is D1. It's PBR 2018-01, and this was for uh, utilities and RS-40 zoning. Uh, the applicant has requested this be continued to your June meeting. They got it in by the deadline, so it's automatically continued to June. No votes <coughs> needed on this item. Okay. We want to do uh, item four. I mean, there's no one signed up for that. I figured that could be handled on consent, too, the parkland. Sure. I'll let David come up and address that okay. item. Chairman, members of the board, this next item does require a public hearing. It is for the sale or transfer of parkland. Um, in this case, uh, the Long Creek Golf Course was purchased by the city or taken over by the city and is becoming a park. There are there's a piece of land that's shown in yellow on this map that is actually part of the property but is completely surrounded by uh, land owned by Harvard Realty. It's one of the holes of the golf course. It's only served by a 10-foot wide access easement. Um, this transfer would exchange that piece, which is less than two acres, for a larger piece of land just to the west, shown in blue on this map, owned by Harvard Realty. And that exchange would, would allow us to have contiguous land, and it's in an area for where there may be a future spur up to the Mountain to Sea Trail. So we <clears throat> generally we recommend no net loss of parkland. In this case, it would be a net gain. Uh, it gets rid of a piece of land that's isolated as an island and only served by a 10-foot access easement, and it would allow us to pick up this other piece of property in exchange. So staff would recommend approval of this. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. This is a public hearing. No one has signed up. Does anyone want to speak in support of this? Anyone like to speak in opposition? Now I'll declare the public hearing closed. <coughs> Second. Motion by Mr. Grubb, second by Mr. Leak. Any discussion? Yeah, yes. a few questions on this. Sure. Um, I had some specific questions about the um, the conservation network buffer areas and whether that was still part of the, the – I know that's separate from the city, but is that still contemplated that there was going to be these buffer areas purchased um, as well? Yes. Uh, Chair, members of the uh, members of the board, uh, William Royson, Recreation Parks Director, Wander East First Street, Suite 407. Um, as part of this agreement, the conservation fund would um, purchase two 100-foot easements uh, and deed those over to the city um, at the closing um, of this deal. Okay, so that's still still contemplated. Yes. Um, and um, and you still feel confident you'll be able to access the potential mountains to sea trail route through that property that would be um, where the beltway interchange is? Yes, the conservation fund um, engaged the, the landowner that whose property uh, abuts the property that we, we, we would be gaining. Um, and the initial conversations and thoughts are that he would be willing to grant us an easement through his property for a soft surface trail to provide access to that uh, spur of the mountains to sea trails. Okay. And the fact that a road is going through there is not going to be a hindrance to getting access? You mean the beltway? Yes. Um, it's going to have some impact on, on our park, um, but it's far enough, far enough north that we don't think it, we would um, lose our ability to have access to a spur of the mountains, mountains to sea trails, okay. or would it impede any de any development for our park? All right, thank you. No, that was my question. I had one other question about the zoning that maybe um, Gary or about the um, the Hubbard property that um, would be gaining this new piece of land. And is it it's zoned MUS? Is that correct? I'll speak to that. Um, 
the piece is zoned RS-20 that they're gaining, and the surrounding land is zoned MUS. Right. That, so the they MUS would. That's um, what I was wondering about. What what kind of constraints are on the MUS? Well, the MUS is, of course, special use zoning. I'm not sure if that's two phase or single phase. That's already designed out, but to to add this and incorporate it, they can add it to their design if they're using this part for single family residential, or they may do some kind of uh, amendment and ask to rezone the RS20 to MUS as well. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? We have a motion for approval. Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Next item on your agenda is zoning docket F1577. Petitioners Weedle Properties, Properties LLC. And uh, the site is 10.1 acres, 01 acres, located on the east side of Chickasaw Drive, north of Robin Hood Road. And the request is a general use rezoning request with no site plan from AG Agricultural to RS-20. Of course, AG uh, requires a minimum lot size of 40,000 square feet, lot widths of uh, 150 feet in width, and the RS-20 are 20,000 square foot uh, in size. Uh, this is Legacy's Growth Management Plan. It's located uh, just north uh, east of Louisville in the yellow suburban neighborhoods growth management area three just west of the future beltway and this is a subject property there shown highlighted in yellow it is currently undeveloped um, predominantly wooded um, the green area is the 500 foot mailing uh, radius notification area uh, the site is on the eastern side of Chickasaw Drive between Yadkinville Road and Robin Hood Road uh, the lavender color located to the right to the east is the uh, proposed beltway uh, and just north of the site there will be a future connection uh, from Chickasaw to Tomahawk Road. Uh, the staff report mentioned uh, accidentally that that was going to be an interchange. That will not be an interchange, but it will be a connection there to Tomahawk. The interchange will be further down at uh, Robin Hood. Uh, so much of the surrounding property is zoned agricultural, uh, but as you'll see in another image and in right now you can see that there is RS-20 zoning directly to the uh, northeast and so further RS-20 zoning uh, southwest of the subject property there which is located within Louisville. Aerial photographs showing the development pattern, um, some water bodies further uh, to the west of the subject property. Again, mostly heavily wooded. And these are the area plans. This is a 2012 West Suburban Area Plan, uh, recommended single family residential in yellow for all this entire area, uh, up to a density of uh, five units per acre. And this is the 2018 draft uh, suburban, West Suburban Area Plan, which recommends generally the same, but a little bit more dense, uh, up to eight units per acre, single family detached uh, residential development. Uh, this is out on the site. The subject property is located to the right. Uh, this is looking north on Chickasaw. This is directly south of the site. And this is looking across the street. I, I did not mention earlier, public water is available to this property, but public sewer is, is nowhere uh, near available. So even though the area plan recommends maybe RS-7, maybe RS-9 zoning there, there's really no sewer around, so they would need to rely whatever development takes place in this general area on uh, septic systems. Uh, just backing out a little bit at a different scale, uh, you can see the subject property again there in yellow. And uh, in light blue, uh, you see the AG zoning in, in uh, the surrounding area. But it's really kind of a pocket <coughs> of AG zoning in this area. On this portion of Chickasaw, it certainly does have the, uh, uh, the flavor of a rural uh, area, but it's really surrounded by much denser zoning. You have RS-20 zoning directly to the north and west, RS-9 zoning a little bit further to the east, um, RS-20 zoning southwest, and RS-9 zoning along Yadkinville Road. Uh, and the Glad Acres area is just further south here across from Chickasaw. So uh, it is zoned AG, but there's a, a real much more intense surrounding zoning uh, around this property. So staff really sees no compelling reason why this and the surrounding properties, particularly with availability of public water, 
uh, growth management area three, uh, that it should remain agricultural. Uh, so again, it's located within a pocket surrounded by denser zoning districts. Uh, it's located within the suburban neighborhoods, growth management area, area three. It is served with public water. And the RS-20 district is consistent with the, the subject request, uh, and it's adjacent to other RS-20 zone property. Um, and staff sees no negative transportation-related issues to this request. Uh, certainly, we are aware that there has been a dramatic increase in traffic in this general area over the last 10 to 15 years, and that will probably increase. Uh, Brookberry is not completely built out. You've got uh, Reagan High School. You've got two other schools uh, coming online there and new subdivision activity. Um, but as I mentioned also in the staff report, we, we project about 12 to 1,300 trips per day going down up and down Chickasha now. Um, and that road can handle about 15,000 cars per day. So um, it is, it has increased in traffic in the general area, and, and we're not saying that there's not some bottlenecks at some of the major intersections. Um, but overall, from this, this particular request, going from AG to RS-20, staff does not see a significant traffic in issue related to this. So uh, staff's recommendation is for approval, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Any questions of staff at this time? Okay. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. This is a public hearing. Uh, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> Alex Carter, 503 High Street, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 27101. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I just have a few brief comments to um, uh, talk in addition to the information that Gary provided you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of Louisville's plans as well. They have an interest in this corridor as well. Um, uh, the jurisdiction for Louisville is just to the west of this site, and they have a plan that they've just posted that shows the existing zoning. Our site is in the dark green here in the center. You can see the AG around it. The lighter yellow surrounding that is the RS-20, RS-9, then along the west and south, and then RS-30 further west. You can see the proposed corridor, excuse me, the proposed transportation corridor to the east. And you can also see some of the streams that are located, in, in particular one that's in the northeast corner of this property. And then this is their future land use map. Our site is here in the black outline. And you can better see their conservation corridor. The light green for them is proposed as what they call rural residential and the lighter yellows are suburban residential. So again, from their perspective as well, uh, just to kind of follow up the comments about this whole area is really forecasted and planned to be residential in nature. There is no sewer available, public sewer. The nearest sewer is to the south, about 3,000, 3,500 feet away. Thank you. Okay, thanks, sir. Anyone else like to speak in support of this? Then we'll turn to, to the opposition, uh, Mr. Alsop. Bob also 940 Kinley Circle, Winston-Salem. I appreciate what the board does and the planning staff and the opportunity to speak. And I've been writing notes for weeks, and I've just decided to go off script, which is these days extremely dangerous. <laughs> so I would just like to speak from the heart. Uh, my family's owned land off Chickasha for 50 years, soon to be the fourth generation. Uh, with the advent of increased development in the area, I've spent many, many, many weeks and hours visiting local residents, People who've lived in the area 60, 70 years. I've watched the development of the Robin Hood Corridor. I've watched the school, Jefferson, the proposed new school at the junction of Louisville, Vienna, and Robin Hood. I've watched the Brookberry development. I've watched the phenomenal increase in traffic congestion. All of us are affected by any change in our backyard. And I know that's not very useful these days to comment on, but it makes you think. And the journey here, the big picture, is I know the area cold. We've had the privilege of being in that environment for years. What I'm seeing is a change that I'm not sure we're prepared for. I respect greatly all of your comments. I profoundly disagree with the comment on traffic handling. I've spent many hours the last three weeks going in the morning between 7 and 9 to the Brookberry School off of Brookberry 
to the Lewis Wavana Elementary School. I've tried to get the town between seven and nine from the Robin Hood West to Muddy Creek and back into the city limits, uh, back into the South Creek Parkway area. I've tried to go down Yakinville into the Renolda area. And the, the bottom line is I respect the development. We are in a major crunch of handling the traffic. Now we have 60 more acres going on Glad Acres with 92 proposed units. We have a new middle school going up at the previously mentioned site. I use this as an opportunity as a sounding board to ask that we take a deep breath with that proposed zoning and growth management area. Are we headed in the right direction until we've really thought through where's the traffic going? From a small point of view, the small picture is those of us on Chickasha, my neighbor Bob is going to speak in a second. It's purely personal thoughts. We're not representing each other. Uh, the question is, can Chickasha handle more development? It's already a cut through. You go out there, the average speed isn't 45. It's probably between 45 and 70. People speed. There's road rage. There's uh, short tempers. There's huge backup at the Lewis Falvena Elementary School when there's pickup and drop off. And now we're going to increase the numbers and the density of traffic. And I think my message is simply to say from a personal statement, there will be change and people need places to live. We really have not adapted to the safety, the access of schools, the access of work, the access to town. Where are we going to address some of that? I went to many of the meetings with the Glad Acres at the Louisville Planning Board, and really, it's just not addressed. It really was not a topic of very extensive conversation. So I say that in an effort, if no other reason, to take a deep breath and examine what are we doing and can more development on the Chickasha area really be handled in a way that will make the public safe, the neighborhood safe. And if nothing else, it made me read the Legacy 30 Plan and the County Farmland Protection Plan, and the themes are unbelievably redundant. Safety, quality of life, balanced development, balanced agriculture with our day-to-day -day city and workaday lives and safety of children. So with that in mind, I simply wanted to have it recorded. I'm very concerned about the ability to handle the congestion, the traffic, and the safety of those involved. I appreciate your time. Thanks, sir. Mr. Biscoborn. Thank you for uh, letting me talk tonight. My name is Bob Biscoborn. My wife and I are here. We probably have uh, be more impacted by this rezoning than anyone. We live immediately on the south side of this piece of property, uh, have known the owners of the property, have been there for years, and um, just wanted to mention a few things that probably may or may not be aware of. Um, I don't know if it's required to have an environmental impact statement for all the the animals and the wildlife. This is a very unique piece of property out there. Uh, on, on Dr. Alsop's property are some little small lakes and the animals, it's a huge population that live down in the valley towards where the beltway will be in the future, but they cross over several times a day. And we're talking deer and coyotes and fox and turkeys and we watch them, right? They go through our property, right alongside the property. They go to the lake. And if you've ever had an opportunity to watch a whole herd of deer go to a lake and drink, and then they go back to the refuge of the forest again, back and forth all day long. With the development, I think we're going to just disrupt that. These animals will not be able to leave their refuge, go across Chickasha Drive and out across and get there uh, to, uh, to drink and go back again as, uh, with all the housing development. I think that that's just going to put a real buffer on uh, those animals. One neighbor that can't be here tonight has spent years feeding the animals out there almost year round. So they're used to living in that area and they're safe and they're protected and there's no hunting and it's just an amazing theater to watch the animals out there and uh, uh, so I just bring that up that it looks like that that's probably going to to be disrupted um, and I don't know how you protect it I don't know what you do but it's I see it's going to go away and 
Um, and the other thing that we see, and it's been kind of a, a checks and balances of the nature, is they, there's quite a few coyotes that live in that area, and they have kept the deer population very manageable. The deer population right in this area that we see several times a day are, are anywhere from about 11 to 17 in this family that run. Right on the other side of us, on the south side, is Hunter Hills Equestrian Center. They have a huge population of horses. They run it as a business. They run summer camps. They do riding camps. They do riding lessons over there. They do, uh, it's a, a rescue area for horses that have been abused. They have ducks and cats. Their concern is, and I bring that tonight, is should this development move forward and the deer population be driven away, the coyotes are going to go somewhere, and they're concerned about, out in their pastures, they keep uh, big watering troughs for the horses. The horses are in the pastures all night long, and they're concerned that the coyotes will migrate that way and start attacking their horses. So I just wanted that on the, on the record, too. It's a very big concern for them that the, to get water, they'll come and use those watering troughs, and then they're going to have the, have the horses there to attack. And so, um, one other thing that's very unique about this area, and I uh, mentioned is, I don't know if you've ever seen it, seen one, but they're called alligator turtles. They're very prehistoric looking. They live down in the woods behind us. They come up on a regular basis. They cross this piece of property. They go to Dr. Alsop's lakes. They drink. Uh, they tell me they go about two weeks uh, between watering. Then they come back across the land again. Uh, sometimes I see them out in the road. Uh, they're just the most god-awful looking animals you ever saw. They, they're very prehistoric. They're very old. I go with welding gloves and I pick them up out of the road and get them off to the side of the road. They bite like crazy. And um, researching them on the internet, they say that uh, there's only a few remaining. They're in this portion of the Mid-Atlantic. In 2014, they went on the endangered species list and this is one of the few places they live anymore, and they go back and forth there on a regular basis. And I just also wanted to build on the doctor's comments about the traffic out there. We have at the end of Chickasha is an elementary school. At the other end of Chickasha is going to be another new school. Right down Robin Hood is an elementary school. Right down Metal Arc is another school. The traffic has just absolutely overwhelmed the area because they use Chickasha as a cut through to get between Yadkinville Road and Robin Hood. And the only other way to cross through is Olivet Church Road, which is further east. What is concerning is it happened about four or five years ago. In the afternoons, the parents go to collect their children. And the schools don't have that kind of off-site parking, and so they stop on the road. They just park on the road. The state highway department has put signs up there, and they didn't last any time. They shut down the road, and here a few years ago, right around the corner is a volunteer fire department. They were needed, and they couldn't get through. The road shut down both directions. Everybody parked in the road. They had to leave the Vienna Volunteer Fire Department, they had to turn around amongst all these cars, go back out to the Yadkinville Road, the old highway, down to Olivet Church Road, come all the way back around, back up Robin Hood. 19 minutes later, they got to where they needed to go, where normally it would have taken them about a minute. That's happening every day out there, and it's just going to get worse. And here, we fussed about this uh, a few years ago. The State Highway Department came in. They widened Chickasha Drive 12 inches, and then they raised the speed limit 10 miles an hour. So 
So now the traffic, like the doctor said, boils down through there instead of not doing the speed limit, they're probably doing 55, 60 mile an hour flying down through there. And then, you know, just to, to even add more traffic onto that road is a huge problem. So, thank you very much. That's my concerns and I'll leave it to you. Thank Thanks, you. sir. Is there any time left? I can't imagine. Two minutes. Okay. Anyone else like to speak? Yes, sir. Got two minutes left. Come give us your name and address, please, sir. Good evening. Thank you, Thank you for letting me speak. I happen to live just the other side of that property off the end of Tommy Hawk G Road. Give us your name and address, please, sir. Jerry Lofman, 5856 Tommy Hawk Road, <coughs> which is the very end at the end of Tommy Hawk Road on the map coming through that property. The property's been in the family for 170 years. And we sort of like to keep some of that hard fuel and stuff. But my main biggest concern I'm saying is when you get on the zone new property you're talking about there, there is a <coughs> creek branch that runs through there. It runs all the time. And I see these turtles and these deers and everything all down there too. But my concern is it's a slope up. It's maybe 15 feet up above the branch on that side of the property, or in the middle of this property that drops down to a lower level of property. I'm concerned about run, runoff and what's going to happen with a lot of septic tanks and what's going to happen to that branch and, and water and creek, creek that's there, along with the animals they mentioned. They mentioned the traffic on uh, Chickasha. It's terrible on Oliver Church Road in the evening, too. When you get to the end of Tommy Hawk Road, you might wait for 20 cars to pass before you can you know, get on Oliver Church Road to get out in traffic. So the traffic's getting heavy everywhere out in that area. And I'd like to point that out. You know, if they want to do a low residential up there, I don't have a problem. Something could be controlled a little better. But I wish they were sitting up putting that much up there, and that much traffic in there. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Anyone else like to speak? Senator one, I've declared the public hearing closed. <clears throat> any comments or questions? I had a question. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. The gentleman for the petitioner who spoke. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, sorry. Um, Alex Carter. Uh, Mr. Carter, I had a question about the plan you showed. Was that a Louisville um, plan? It is. So they recently, that is their comprehensive plan that they recently posted for this area. And it includes area in Forsyth County outside the jurisdiction of Louisville? So That's correct. Okay. Um, and could you, would you mind putting that back up? Do they still have some ETJ out there? No, they, my understanding, Louisville doesn't have any ETJ. They do, whenever they plan for that area, they do it in consultation with our staff. I believe Kirk Erickson worked in conjunction with them on their plan to try to get them to mesh up as good as they could. Okay. Um, I was wondering about those long green areas there that you called something having to do with conservation. Yeah, they call these conservation areas on their legend. It's a little difficult to see on this one, though. So those are basically the streams and buffers around the streams, areas that may contain hydric soils or wetlands and uh, or steep slopes and sensitive areas. And the, what was the recommendation for those, that they still be residentially developed but at a less density or not developed at all? No, those will be conserved for, okay. for as buffers to the stream areas. Okay. Um, I just want to make the comment that um, that some of this type of planning might address some of the concerns that the residents raised. Um, it's not in our area plan. It's not in the West Suburban area plan. But that's the kind of thing that I think would be appropriate to put in the West Suburban plan, that, that type of recommendation um, that would potentially conserve some of these areas that the deer are in. Keep in mind, most of those areas are already in the UDO as off limits for development mm -hmm. um, because they are floodplains um, and um, associated uh, buffer areas with those streams. Depending on the type of stream they are, they already have a prescribed buffer. You have to stay off of them. So, you know, I, I think that's I think that's probably something that we probably could look at in the future, including. But again, most of that is already at least for the narrowness of that one would be covered uh, within 
what's currently in the UDO as far as what would be allowed to be developed. What you find in the development of the rural areas like this is those corridors are pretty much maintained by those requirements. They're not always interconnected, but they'll still have a way of moving along these corridors. They'll, they'll get more concentrated in a narrower corridor, but typically there's going to remain some way for the wildlife to still move and exist. As long as people follow the regulations right. in the book, correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that if there was something more planned out that we could make an effort to preserve some of these areas, especially the continuity, the contiguity there. Can the deer get to that area? Any other comments, questions, anyone? Anyone care to make a motion? A motion for approval. Motion, Ms. Smith, and a second. I'll second the motion. Discussion. I just, I'm really torn on this one. This is this is a tough one for me because I, I, uh, it's difficult to watch as the few pockets of more rural um, areas continue to kind of disappear um, and we, we face the same thing on the eastern side of the county um, and I, I, I understand the concern about the traffic as well it, it's unfortunate that it appears development in this particular pocket has kind of outpaced um, the the traffic or the the road system um, eventually I think that will catch up but it's kind of a chicken or an egg situation um, but we we do have these um, growth management areas and these these area plans for a reason and and I go back to conversations we've had before where we've kind of said okay we we're doing our higher level planning for an area when we're putting those plans in place um, so it's difficult for me to then tell a the developer that they can't rely on those plans. So I'm just, I'm really, there's a, there's a lot of friction there for me between those two, two issues. Yeah, I, I do feel some of that friction with this. I think when you look at um, the overall area and what's in it, I don't think that our zoning process is appropriate to restrict a property owner's use if they meet the requirement, I think there is a real need for conservation. And I think if there's anybody who wants to, to be active in that, there are organizations and ways to say, okay, we need to preserve some of this land. I don't think the individual zoning process is where we do that on that scale with that. Uh, so, and, and I agree with you on so that. I agree that it's dis I'm, I'm a country girl myself. so. I, I agree with that, but I don't think it's our role on an individual rezoning case to make that restriction on the use of the property. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I agree. Yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, you made some very good points. Um, my issue with this is that, um, and Ms. Dahls brought up legacy, and, and in legacy we talk about preserving the rural character <coughs> of, of the county. And I, I don't see that we have a good mechanism for doing that in our, in our mm -hmm. UDO. And that's something that I would like to see us look at as we do it, when we do a new comprehensive plan to, to try to put some meat in there where we can find some real practical solutions. We, ha we did the farmland preservation plan, but all, most of that is voluntary. So there really isn't anything to uh, practically preserve what we have left. And we've had several cases recently of ag land going to residential. This, I think, presents some unique issues just because of the configuration of, of the land around it. And it, I think that the, the, the argument is a little stronger for, for conversion to residential here. But 
um, in general, I think we, I would like to see us look at, at uh, finding some ways to preserve agricultural land. Yeah, I think the, the beltway coming through that area is an influence to as far as the future of that area goes. And they're restricting the property owner's rights sometime. You know, that's something I think about a lot. Right. You know, you purchase property, you move into an area, there has to be some foresight that this area is going to eventually change. It's not going to remain the same. So, Rightly or wrongly, um, you can consider it what you may, but keep in mind that while this property is on ag, in the legacy growth management area, it's not in the rural policy area. It's in GMA3. And in order to maintain consistency amongst all of our area plans, I mean, we have the low density provision, which is currently zero to five units per acre. And, you know, uh, the determinant on that is to analyze what's in the area and also whether or not sewer is available. And in this case, sewer is not available. Septic is, if you look at most of the area around it, there, although there are a couple pockets of RS9, obviously RS9 from a sewer standpoint would not make sense. So in analyzing those things, that's why we felt like that the RS20 zoning would be the most appropriate here. So. It's probably unlikely you'll get, it with a stream on the property and some of the other topography and things, that you're actually going to get a house every 20,000 square feet of property. And I'm, and I'm not I sure. Know. I'm not sure what the analysis has, whether so, or not they've even done a septic analysis at this point. That's beyond what so. we got here. Right. But the density of it, I think, is is another factor in my supporting this. Any other comments, any board members? We have a motion for approval. Those in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. I guess we're to uh, staff report, uh, Mr. Mark. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first thing I have on here is Paul. Uh, I don't think Paul had a chance to talk to speak to everyone before he left, but he had a meeting. He had to be at in Hickory at six, so that's why he made a hasty exit after the consent agenda, or as part of the consent agenda, actually. Uh, another item for staff report is uh, we continued two cases today. We already have uh, there were four cases that were submitted in for pre-submittal uh, for June. Uh, and the deadline for general use and limited use cases would be on Monday. So, you know, we may have some more cases added to that. You ready for that? Are you? Yeah. Uh, being handed out now uh, is the information I believe that y'all request, uh, that the planning board requested uh, at the last work session. This is the information that would be going to the Community Development, Housing, and General Government Committee next Tuesday on UO, uh, UDO 283. And that is the text amendment that you considered several months ago dealing with multifamily in the HB and GO districts. Um, like I said, this will be going to uh, committee um, next Tuesday. And I believe what, um, what the planning board talked about at the work session was getting this information and then uh, analyzing it. And I believe the thought was to put that on as a discussion item uh, for your uh, May 24th work session. So if that's the consensus of the group, uh, then that's kind of what we'll plan on. I don't believe we'd ask for this. We'd know it's this much, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot of information. It was a lot of information for staff to gather uh, and, and provide, but... Um, Who asked for this? <laughs> uh, I believe y'all did. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, you asked to see it. The, the Community Development, Housing, and General Government Committee actually asked for the information as part of... I believe they've considered it in work session <laughs> two, three times now. <laughs> and every time we got a little more information requested. So uh, that's... That's the outcome of all those requests. And did, uh, I'm sorry, did you say it was coming up on the agenda next week? Or? It will be on the agenda on Tuesday. Paul's plan is to let them know that the planning board is going to be looking at this at, their, at your work session on the 24th and kind of see where that goes. Like I said, I don't, they're going to take it up. I don't know whether they're going to make a decision at that point, whether or not they're going to perhaps wait for you all to... Um, if there's a reconsideration of your previous amendment based on all this information, I'm not exactly sure, but Paul is going to let them know at their meeting next Tuesday 
Um, and if anyone's interested in, in coming to that meeting, the meeting time has been moved up to 3 o'clock uh, next Tuesday instead of the regular time, which is 4.34. 4, 4, 4. 4. 4.30, I think. Okay. So it's been moved to 3. The next item on the uh, staff report is rolling right into your May work session. Um, as you can see by the volume of information there, that's going to be a big item, but we have a number of other items on there, so definitely plan for two hours. Um, we're going to have the UDO consultant uh, phase one, uh, the update uh, from the consultant on phase one. In addition to that, on there will be a report and recommendation dealing with street standards that came off your work program, a report and recommendation dealing with consideration to changes to the uh, transportation impact statement uh, study that is uh, required for certain zoning cases of a certain size. It will be a discussion of the infill standards and then that item, and there's probably a couple other little miscellaneous items on there as well. So, like I said, it's going to be a full agenda. John, are you still with us? I'm still with you. <laughs> <laughs> you said plan for four hours? <laughs> well, I said plan for two. I, two technically, I believe meeting. by your rules, it's, it's a two-hour meeting. So, I, you know, I'm not going to say plan for more than that, but uh, <laughs> it probably could take more than that. Anticipate some carryover. Right. Um, just kind of an up. <laughs> Just kind of an update uh, at their meeting on Monday night, uh, City Council did approve UDO 284, which was the building material um, um, requirements related to retail stores, and I believe the county is going to be taking that up uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. I believe that item is getting pushed over to them, so I think they're going to take it up before their budget um, gets on, into full swing. Just a couple other items, uh, just to let you know, this is a kudos to some of our staff. Uh, the uh, Employee Excellence Awards for 2017 are coming up in June. We kind of lag a little bit behind. But we have two of our employees who are among uh, the 12 finalists uh, for uh, Employee of the Year for st specific categories, and that's citywide. Just to have two out of 12 out of 2,500 employees, that's pretty good. Um, couple more things. Um, since Paul's not here, we can talk about this a little more freely. I'm sure he'll watch this uh, on replay on TV 13. But um, coming up at the end of July, of course, will be Paul's final days. And we have a couple of uh, tentative dates. There will be the city-county government reception, which is kind of the formal event, kind of what we call the cake and punch event. And that will be that's tentatively scheduled for Friday, July 20th. And of course, you know, planning board. We want we want planning board members there. Uh, we certainly want planning board members at the uh, other event, which we tentatively have planned for Tuesday, Tuesday, July 31st, which is Paul's final day. And that's kind of an informal send off that will be somewhere um, locally at a restaurant somewhere. Um, so, again, those dates are tentative, but that's kind of what we're looking for at this point. Uh, we have an update on, or can we speak about the update on replacement, or? That's not up to me. That would be up to um, the folks that are running, I believe, the assessment process. Okay. So I'm not sure exactly if who the planning board has been communicating with on that, uh, whether it's just been totally being run by the uh, county and um, city deputy directors at this point. Or, Sorry. Um, The city county government will cover much of the cost of the send off, the informal, I mean, yeah, the informal event we're planning on having, um, but we would welcome any contributions from staff and planning board members to help defray some of those expenses. And we'll send an email out uh, with information later on in June once some of that stuff gets buttoned up. And finally, um, Margaret has some info that she wants to share about a workshop that she recently attended in Greensboro. Just, I'll be really quick. Um, I went to, a, um, to hear a speaker that um, the city of Greensboro had come named Chris Leinberger. It was very interesting. He's a developer. He's also in charge of the real estate program at University of Michigan. And I won't spend much time talking about what he talked about, but that was walkable communities. And he's, he's really national. He has a lot. He does a lot of marketing work. Um, and his message was that people, young people, Older people, particularly, are demanding walkable communities. And then we, as a community, need to figure out how to build density 
and retrofit our existing areas um, because if we don't get on board with that, we're going to fall behind as a community. I thought it was a really important message. But I thought even more important to me was the purpose of this um, lecture is Greensboro is beginning their comprehensive plan, and they're doing a series of community conversations. So they're bringing in speakers to get people talking and thinking about what they want the future of their community to be. So I just, it's a challenge I have to you all that, you know, we're talking about updating our comprehensive plan in probably three to four years, but maybe sometime in the next two to three years, what, we're, what I think would be great for us to do is to do our own speaker series, bring in speakers to, um, to get us thinking about that comprehensive plan. Um, I would hope that we bring in people who challenge us, um, maybe even some controversial speakers, um, just to get us all thinking about what we really want in our future. So I would challenge you to, over the next few years, as you hear people, um, maybe in your professions, um, speak, uh, kind of, you know, let us know those names. We can start generating a list of people. Um, what Greensboro did for Chris Leinberger was he had, did a community presentation one day, and then um, it was actually a partnership with one of their development associates, development organizations. I don't know if it was the home builders or not, but he then spoke to developers at the the next morning. And I would think that we could partner with people like the home builders. Maybe the Neighborhood Alliance, maybe some of our health organizations um, to bring in speakers that their organizations would be interested in, um, as well as sort of general stuff for our community. So start listening to people, noting those down, and sharing that information with us um, so that we've got some people to turn to um, in the next couple of years if hopefully we do this kind of thing. Thanks. Right, that's that's Thank all you. I have. Uh, staff report? Board members, anything for the good of the order? I have one question, yes. please. Um, last <clears throat> meeting with the city council members, the goat farm on. So I was trying to figure out what happened there. Did it did it pass? Did it get? No. Uh, the um, council member for the ward put forth a substitute motion to continue it to their June meeting. June 4th. The, yeah, June 4th. yeah, whatever that first Monday in June is, June 4th, uh, at where it will be considered again. Um, basically, they asked for the continuance to um, be able to solicit perhaps more input. They, the public hearing had been closed, but the motion allowed for the opportunity to reopen, uh, reopen the public hearing if there were more folks there that had additional new information to share. So when it goes before the council, they hear the same thing that we hear, I presume. Is that correct? Oh, yes, although the um, for uh, the uh, staff presentation, there were some technical issues with the presentation, so Paul actually had to wing it and do it verbally because the, the PowerPoint didn't load properly onto the new PC that was over there. But, uh, yes, they heard the same things that you heard. I believe there was probably more information that was shared um, by the both the proponents and opponents because they had more folks of each at the meeting that got up and spoke. But... The, the staff report was the same. Uh, all the information that was presented here was also uh, included in the minutes that went to them. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Somebody has a question. No, sir. No. You, you can ask staff afterwards if you would like. Yeah, we'll be around afterwards. Okay. Ms. Smith? All right, it's a motion to adjourn. I think we'll agree to that. Yeah. Last time you were not here for a German, we just sat there. <laughs>